Good morning. Welcome to Fall at Grace. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're so happy to have you worshiping with us today. We acknowledge and give thanks for the land where we live, work, and worship, and to the people who have cared for it. This land is the traditional territory of the Treaty 7 peoples, who are the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai Nations, the Sutina Nation, and the Stoti Nakoda Nation, including Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony Nations, as well as Metis Nation Districts 5 and 6. Fall is a busy time at Grace. There are many activities starting and all sorts of things to get involved with as we kind of find our way back from the relaxation of the summer and uh, get focused on the, it almost seems like a new year every September, doesn't it? At Grace on September 11th, we'll be starting the lectionary Bible study in the family room. This is 9.30 to 10.30 and anybody is welcome. On September 16th, there will be a presentation on engaging with vulnerable people at Grace from 1.30 to 3. If you're interested in this, please contact Cindy. You can call the church or email Cindy to register and find out more about this important th area that we all could probably learn more about. If you've not yet registered your children for Sunday school, please do so online as soon as possible as Sunday school is starting today. I want to acknowledge the lovely flowers in the sanctuary today, which are to the glory of God and in celebration of a very special day for Audrey and Dan Van Nguyen, who are celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary. And sadly, please hold the family of Rob Purdy in your prayers as they mourn the loss of Rob, who died on August 27. A service to celebrate his life and a reception following will be held at Grace on September 30th. Uh, that's at 11 o'clock here. So, turning to worship, as we prepare for worship, Please rise as you are able for the lighting of the Christ candle. And Gith, would you like to come up and light? We'll also be singing the introit. Friends, the words of our responsive call to worship invite us into a time of praise, proclamation, and prayer. 
So let's share this invitation. I invite you to join your voices with mine in the bolded text that is printed in the bulletin or will appear on the screen if you're joining online. The God of life gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. God frees the prisoners and opens the eyes of the blind. We will put our trust in God's goodness. God's goodness endure forever. Let us worship God. Friends, let us lift our voices in praise to God by singing together praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Uh, and uh, that's hymn number 321 in the book of praise, which is in the pew rack in front of you. Or if you're joining online, the words will be on screen. Let's lift our praise together. invites us to move towards God with both reverence and humility. Let us lift our hearts in adoration and confession and be caught up in the movement of God's goodness and grace as we acknowledge God's majesty and holiness, while at the same time seek God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us pray. Direct and help us, O Lord, in all our deeds, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
hear these words inviting us into a time and space of reconciliation. Because our actions do not always match our words, because we can be forgetful of your mercy towards others, because faith without works is lifeless, but mostly because you are faithful and you invite our confession, we dare to tell the truth about ourselves and this world, knowing that in your mercy, you stand ready to forgive. So friends, let us pray together these words of confession. God of mercy, you are ever mindful of those on the margins. We confess we fail to keep our eyes open for those same people. We have been silent when we should have spoken up in the face of injustice. Our generosity to others does not match what you offer us. Forgive us for thinking of ourselves first. Renew our commitment to show others the kindness we meet in Jesus Christ. Friends, hear this good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. In the name of Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I invite you to turn your attention to our anthem, which is when in our music, God is glorified.
this time we invite the children to come forward and the youth and the children and youth uh, leaders in church school as well. As they're coming, we do want to say a word of thanks to all who answer the call to teach and lead and to those who answer the call to learn and to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. We are all on that path of learning together, no matter our age. We're glad to set apart these uh, special folks today for their, for their additional calling. Let's see, I think all of our friends are here now, almost. <laughs> Friends, as we start fall at Grace, we recognize that we have many people who are sharing the story of God's love and grace with the kids and youth here at Grace Presbyterian Church. Let's join together in celebrating and confirm how the many people here have answered the call to guide, nurture, grow, and share God's love with intelligence imagination, creativity, and love with the kids and youth of grace. Jesus called his disciples to come and follow him and become fishers of people, sharing the good news of God's redeeming love. Each person here, from the youngest to the most senior in age, has been given gifts and talents to share a unique expression of God's spirit not to keep to ourselves, but to share. And we give thanks for these gifts and talents as we celebrate the response to God's call, represented in the people who are here before us, taking on the ministry of teaching, helping, and leading the kids and youth of grace. So if you are going to help teach or lead or be a rover or a volunteer, a helper in Grace's uh, church school or Grace's youth ministry programming, I'm wondering if you'll just come up here and stand on the, on the dais for us so that folks can see you. So friends in the congregation, I have a question for you. And I'll give you the answer, so it's not, it's not a difficult question, but uh, the question is, do you, the congregation of Grace Presbyterian Church, affirm and give your support to the gifts of the Spirit the teachers, helpers, rovers, leaders, and volunteers have for sharing God's love and grace with kids and youth of grace? And if so, please answer, we do. And will you also support these leaders with your prayers, encouragement, care, and grace-filled love? If so, please answer, we will. At the celebration of baptism, we make the promise to nurture God's beloved children in the faith. You, as teachers, leaders, and helpers, carry a particular joy and responsibility. God is calling you to teach and lead our children and our youth and represent the gospel of Jesus Christ with gentleness and insight as the Spirit guides you in your words and your witness with them. Through this ministry, faith will be nurtured and deepened, equipping the kids and youth of grace to live into the love and grace of Jesus that he shares each and every day with us. Therefore, we ask you the following questions. Do you promise by the grace of God to give yourselves to this calling with diligence, energy, and love, and to be guided by the Spirit and the story of God's love made known in Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, we do. Do you promise to trust in God's guidance, ever seeking to learn as you are led and as you lead, to listen as much as you speak, and to walk with the kids and youth of grace with faith and authenticity? If so, please answer, we do. So, all of you, I have a question for each and every one of you, and uh, your voice is important as we 
affirm the spirit-given gifts to all these leaders who will be working with you this year. So, will ye, each of you participate with enthusiasm and joy through listening and learning by caring for each other and for these leaders and by bringing your questions with you as you explore with these leaders God's incredible love for you? And if so, will you please stand up, jump up, and shout, we will. So, okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. It's jump up and shout. We will. So let's try it. One, two, three. Okay. A little more energy. One, two, three. We will. Okay. All right. We'll take that as a, as a resounding yes. Let us pray. God of creation, you have gifted these people with skills, creativity, curiosity. We pray you would fill them with the power and compassion of your Holy Spirit. Fill them with energy and insight into your word and the story of your faithful heart. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. So friends, before you go, uh, God does not call us to be without fault. God calls us to be faithful. God does not call us to be all-knowing. God calls us to believe and trust in God's goodness. Be dedicated to the call and task of teaching and leading these kids and youth of grace. May God grant you wisdom, patience, and joy in your preparation and teaching. So with that, we're going to start a new season of church school. So if you're age four up to grade six, we're going to go downstairs. And if you're here as a youth in grade seven through 12, you'll stay in the worship service and uh, be a part of today's worship. And so uh, it's a great start to a new year. So we're really excited for that. So can I have four volunteers who raise their hand? to come and grab one of the candles up on the table. And folks who are teaching, you can head downstairs. And other leaders, you can head back to where you were sitting. Thank you. Andrew and Jonathan. Okay, and we'll bring those downstairs. Xander and Scarlett, will you bring those downstairs? Okay. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit as we hear your word read and proclaimed. May we hear what you are saying to the church today and find the courage to follow your will. Amen. The scripture reading for today is James chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 and 14 to 17, page 203 of the New Testament, and Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30, page 37 of the New Testament. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has God not chosen the poor who want in the world to be the rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do really, you do if, well, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. 
Now we are reading verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and, if, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. We will now be reading Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30, page 37 of the New Testament. From there, he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophician origin. She begged to him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child laying on the bed, and the demon God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, James has done it again. I'm sure you remember the takeaway from last week. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Clear, concise, unequivocal. I hope that you, like me, found many opportunities this past week to have that takeaway inform and challenge your thinking and your doing. And here we are again. Another Sunday in James exploring the garden of God and another takeaway. So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Clear, concise, unequivocal, stings a bit, but at least you know the order of things when it comes to James. When our family lived in Memphis, Tennessee in the early 1990s, I was invited to preach at a worship service for the rescue mission in the heart of the city. The person who sent the invitation to me said that the service would have an invitation at the end, encouraging those who were not followers of Jesus to become followers of Jesus. I pushed back. And I don't have anything at all against people hearing the proclamation of the gospel and then being invited to commit themselves to discipleship. I like to believe that I try to do that every Sunday. But I explained to, my, um, to the person who was inviting me, Presbyterians don't really do the invitation and publicly come down to the front kind of thing. Not that we are averse to others doing it, we just do it differently. The person responded to me, this is really important. This is the main reason we are here. If they do not have the spiritual food of Jesus, he said to me, all the food in the world we can offer them is useless. I could see then that a sermon at the rescue mission without an invitation just wasn't the way it was done. So I agreed, reluctantly. After all, I told myself that the church is about spiritual food, yes indeed. And it really shouldn't matter the way people are invited to respond, just that they are. 
So on the day I was invited to preach, the day I was to preach, I stood and proclaimed the gospel as best I could, as I understood it, and then gave the best invitation I knew how to give, which isn't much. I, I was no Billy Graham, but a few people did come forward, much to my surprise, and were promptly met by the staff of the, of the mission. And all in all, I felt pretty good about it. Until I saw the worshipers leaving the service, out the back doors, heading toward the dining hall, hands outstretched at those doors to receive a token. I learned later that the token was an acknowledgement that they had been to worship. And without it, they would get no meal. Now, I'll admit that I've looked out over a good many congregations on a good many Sundays and saw some people out there who might have been there under some duress, fulfilling some quid pro quo. If you don't come to worship, then you can't eat out with us afterwards, that kind of thing. And a few times I have noted that some people are always there on potluck Sundays and never any others. But I don't think that I've ever preached to an audience as captive as those hungry, unhoused men looking for a meal token. Now, I'm not opposed to the food of the spirits, not opposed to the word of faith and food for the body being served in the same place. The garden of God is, after all, big enough for all of it. But I did leave the mission that day wondering about the order of things. There's no doubt in James about the order of things. No doubt at all. Twice in this part of his letter, he refers to the law of Moses from the same section of the book of Leviticus. The first comes from Leviticus 19, 15. Quote, you shall not show partiality to the poor or deference to the great. God doesn't play favorites and neither should you. In the early church, it was not partiality to the poor that was the problem, but deference to the rich. Of course, that was the early church. I'm sure it's not like that anymore. James shows us a scene there in a, an assembly, a worship service, and one person is clad in, in fine clothing, his fingers dripping with gold, and he's given preferential treatment to another whose clothing and bare fingers showed his poverty. This preferential treatment, James says, is contrary to what we know in the law of Moses and what we know of that law as interpreted by Jesus, which is that the poor are rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Those who live close to the edge, who have nothing, are many times those who are most filled with faith. And far from using this as a valorization of poverty, Jesus instead teaches over and over again that those who have means are called to the same faith as those who have few resources. And in this way, should see themselves as members of one family of faith. You remember the story of the widow who puts two copper coins into the temple treasury. All that she has as a model of faith, even as that same temple is taking advantage of her through that temple tax. Likewise, you recall the story of the rich young man whose resources keep him from faith as a model of how riches can get in the way of trust in God 
and following in the way of Jesus. It's taken me a long time to figure out what it was that bothered me so much that day at the rescue mission. I think there was a real sense that those of us who were giving, whether it was me giving the sermon or the mission personnel giving out the food, that we were in a superior position to those who were receiving because of their status as unhoused, because of their ragged clothing, because they carried in their arms all that they possessed, because many of them were addicted, the assumption seemed to be that they lacked in faith, that they needed the bread of heaven as much, if not more, than they needed the bread of earth. They needed a token that proved their faith before they could be fed what their bodies so desperately needed. But James reminds us that it is the poor who often have the most to teach about faith. If we are willing to listen, if we are willing to walk alongside them, if we're ready to sit down together at one table, seeing ourselves as equals in the eyes of God, we would discover that the kingdom of heaven is defined not by silver and gold, but by love that shows no partiality, that does not play favorites. It is this love that is summed up in what James calls the royal law, again from Leviticus 19.18, You've heard this one before, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Unless we see the poor among us as neighbor and not as other, we will not have a chance to learn what they can teach us, what we can share together in one communion. It is telling that even Jesus could be caught up in the tendency to play favorites. It was this text from Mark that really wanted me to ask Jake to preach today. It's a tough one, to say the least, to see Jesus get caught up in that same temptation and tendency to play favorites when he's confronted by the desperate need of a foreign woman He dismisses her as nothing more than a dog. The children must be fed before the dogs, he says, referring to the children of Israel as opposed to Gentiles like her. Now, I cannot tell you how many commentators I have read that tie themselves into knots trying to say that Jesus didn't say what Mark says he did say. I've even heard it said more than once that that Greek word could mean puppies rather than dogs. As if that were somehow better. I suppose you could try it out for yourself and see the next time someone asks for your help, say, I'm sorry, I need to feed the children first before a puppy like you. See how that goes. At any rate, the woman's response assumes the insult. And I think it was her response that even the dogs eat the food that falls from the children's table that must have somehow shaken Jesus out of his temporary temptation to cultural superiority. She is no dog. She is a person who loves her daughter and has faith in Jesus. No playing favorites. No playing favorites. For James and his community, the issues of poor and rich were front and center, as they are today. 
But for us, there are many other voices as well that, are tempted, that we are tempted to ignore. Those who, like the foreign woman who confronts Jesus, we are tempted to show a different kind of treatment because of their perceived otherness. The radical nature of the law here in Leviticus and reaffirmed here in James cannot be ignored. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the absolute best lesson Jesus ever teaches about this concept of loving your neighbor as you love yourself is when he was confronted by a lawyer about this very phrase, wanting to know just who is my neighbor. You remember this. And when the lawyer asks, it's intended to narrow the focus to help him know who to include and who to exclude, who it was okay to treat like a dog and who it was not okay to treat that way. And you remember what Jesus does. He doesn't answer directly. He tells a story of a Samaritan, a hated foreigner who proves to be neighbor. All are our neighbor, especially those we might be tempted to dismiss, to say, sit in the back, or sit at my feet, or wait until the children are fed, and then we'll feed the dogs. There was a time in the history of the Reformed tradition that some of you may remember when many congregations, Presbyterian congregations, would not allow you to participate in Holy Communion without a token. It was a practice that was begun by John Calvin, who would not permit anyone to the table who had not been first examined, preferably by him, as to their worthiness to receive the sacrament. When they had been examined, they would be given a token. Somewhere along the line, thankfully, it occurred to the Reformed churches that if worthiness was a requirement for the table, then no one could take the bread or the cup. Indeed, if there is any requirement for the table of the Lord at all, it is our recognition that we are most certainly not worthy, not one of us, but we are made worthy by the grace of Jesus Christ. That we all stand before God in need of this grace, all of us, without partiality. I wonder what it might have looked like if at the rescue mission that day, we had first shared a meal together. I can see it now. All of us at those tables together, preacher sitting with congregation, housed sitting with unhoused, slurping soup and swigging sweet tea, That's what it would be if you were in Memphis. And breaking bread, slathered in butter, and telling stories, and laughing together, and crying together, and communing with one another. And then, and then we would all move to the sanctuary, fresh from the table, one family of faith, bearing the only token any of us will ever need the grace of God which makes us one. What would that have looked like? I think it would have looked like the kingdom of God. Or as Reverend Jake reminds us from time to time, the kingdom of God. That's the order of things for James. And for the church of Jesus Christ here at Grace and around the world, that's the takeaway. A faith that is alive, that plays no favorites, that transforms us into the people and church God intends us to be. Let that be our prayer for ourselves, for the church writ large, for the world. May it be so. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able and join in singing.
hymn 585. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of all kindness, you look upon all your children in love and your intention is healing for each one and this world which you love and for which Christ died. Confident of your grace, we offer our prayers. We pray for the peace of the world. Move among us by your spirit Break down barriers of fear, suspicion, and hatred. We pray for the people of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and Israel, especially those whose trauma is ongoing, whose grief is raw, and whose longing for peace rings out. Abide also with those in other war-torn places, Sudan, Ethiopia, Syria, Haiti, so many other places that long for peace, yet do not know peace. Heal the human family of its divisions and unite it in the bonds of peace and justice. We pray for our country. Enrich the common life of Canada so that all in this good land can partake in its possibility. We pray that those in our land whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. We pray for the schools of our nation, all the schools in the neighborhoods of Calgary, and especially for the Connaught School as they welcome students to a new year in our neighborhood. Bless the students, teachers, and leaders in our church school that all may experience the grace of Christ and grow as disciples. 
Help us to recognize each day afresh that the children of the church and the children of the city are our children and summon us to care for them without distinction. We pray for those who suffer this day. Surround them with your love. Support them with your strength. Console them with your comfort and give them hope and courage beyond themselves. Be with those who grieve, especially today we remember the family and friends of Rob Purdy. And hear us now in the silence of our hearts as we remember people and situations on our minds today. Eternal God, we give thanks to you for the great community of faith into which you have brought us, for those who have kept safe our scriptures, gathered our songs, built our sanctuaries, and taught us to know and trust you. Grant us grace in our day to live as faithfully as they did and to provide as generously for our children until you bring us with all your people into the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Faith is a gift from the gracious hand of God. How we respond to this gift is our stewardship. Stewardship is everything we do after we say we believe. Let us receive the gifts of God's people. Let us give with joy. Our offerings will now be received.
Let us pray. Generous God, you have given us all we need to follow you. You call us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Bless our gifts and our actions for Christ's sake, so that our faith in his love will show in the work of the Church that bears his name. We pray in his name. Amen. Our concluding hymn is number 732. book of James challenges God's beloved children. You do well if you really fulfill God's royal law. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Go with these words on your heart. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you today and forevermore. Amen.